and all the school parent groups about the country, and you must stand united on this and stamp out this frightful assassin of our youth. You can do it by bringing about compulsory education on the subject of narcotics in general, the great marijuana in particular. That is the purpose of this meeting, ladies and gentlemen, to lay the foundation for a nationwide campaign by you to demand by law such compulsory education. Because it is only through enlightenment that this scourge can be wiped out. Out of the traffic in these drugs, a lawlessness that we can scarcely estimate has grown and is now flourishing. It exists in almost every city and hamlet in the country. It might be interesting and important for you to know some of the methods used in bringing these drugs into the country. And the work of the forces of law and order, which are daily combating the traffic, always at the risk of life by their agents. This ceaseless fight against the drug traffic is directed by the Department of Narcotics, Washington. I've received a letter of vital importance from a member of the Narcotics Bureau. I'm going to read this letter to you. My dear Dr. Carroll, the suppression of the use of marijuana and of the forces lurking behind it are the most important jobs this department is now engaged in. At the outset of this letter, there is one vital fact I would like to submit. There is a powerful agency. I speak of the school parent associations of this country which can be invaluable in stamping out this scourge. Their help, their eternal vigilance, could be the deciding factor in our fight against it. The weed marijuana is grown in every state in the Union. Recently, in the city of Brooklyn, New York, a field of marijuana was found behind a tenement court. The weed was here being cultivated, regularly stripped and dried and sold in schools, and at government army posts in and around New York. The dried leaves and berries are ground up and made into cigarettes by a simple hand machine. The deadly narcotic is thus quickly and easily prepared for its market. The sale of marijuana is even more difficult to detect and halt than the traffic in drugs such as opium, morphine, and heroin. They are hidden in fake jewelry cases, in the heels of shoes, women's shoes especially, because the drugs can be secreted in false heels. Hollowed shaving brushes are another medium. Books with false centers are often used. Watch cases are convenient hiding places. The value of drugs thus seized is enormous. Recently, a huge supply of heroin was taken. It was concealed in an apparently harmless shipment of 35 barrels of olive oil. The deadly drug was burned in the incinerator of the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. And more vicious, more deadly even than these soul-destroying drugs is the menace of marijuana. No doubt many of you do not believe that these things do happen, that they cannot happen to you. You may also believe that the facts have been exaggerated. Let me tell you of something that happened right here in our own city. You probably read about it in the papers. However, I'll give you the real facts behind the case. There was an apartment near one of our high schools. It was run by a woman known as May Coleman. Those young kids up here? Oh, why don't you button up your lips? You're always squawking about something. 
Get more static on the radio. By the way, Ralph, I'm sort of getting a little party Saturday afternoon over at my grandmother's. You know the place of the swimming pool? Like to come? Thanks, Eddie. Maybe I will. I'd sure like to have you. Okay, I'll probably drop over. So long, Ralph. See you later. Hey, Ralph. Hi, kid. Fine, Jack. And you? Oh, great. Where are you heading? Oh. Hey, how do you like that? telling you about. Very nice. I don't know why you want to make such a fuss over that Ralph Wally. Oh, he's a swell swimmer. He made the freshman team that year he went to college. Yeah, and that lets him out. My dad knows his family. None of them are any good. Father and mother just got a divorce from Paris. Yeah? You know, Ralph runs around pretty much in his own. He's been in a couple of gyms. Well, I only try to say hello to him. I don't go around with him. Well, you better not. He's a little too old for us. That's what my dad said. Hmm. Hello, Mary. How are you, Bill? How are you, Ralph? Oh, hello, Ralph. You know my brother Jimmy, don't you? How are you? Well, I'd like you to meet a friend of mine, Jack Perry. Mary, Bill, I know How do you do? Glad to know you. We're going over to Joe's place. Why don't you come along? We have a date to play a set of doubles. Oh, you can play any time. Come on, we'll have some laughs. Oh, we can today, Ralph. Some other time. Can I go along with you? Sure. Hey, I'll see you at dinner, sis. Don't be late, Jimmy. Thank you. 
look at the apartment a little later. Any new prospects? anything except domestic science. Why, Bill, don't you want to learn something about running your own home? The answer is no. <laughs> you know, after that session we had yesterday, I went home and told Mother that the trouble with her pot roast gravy was she hadn't added three heaping teaspoonfuls of olive oil. <laughs> what did she say? She didn't say anything. She just threw me out of the kitchen. <laughs> well, I don't wonder. Hello, children. Hello, Mother. Hello, Mrs. Lane. That was sweet of you, Mother. Gosh, hot chocolate. Thanks, Mrs. Lane. I know you can't study on empty stomachs. Now then, enjoy yourself. He will. She will too, Mrs. Lane. May I? Oh, thank you, kind sir. You're so very, very kind. <laughs> <laughs> now, before we do that math, how about reading some of this? It's swell. Romeo and Juliet. Don't you like it? Uh-huh. You know, when I study this, I, I kind of think of you as... I just sort of feel as though you're there beside me. Well, listen. It is my soul that calls upon thy name. How silver sweet sound lovers' tongues by night. Like softest music to attending ears. Romeo. My dear. What o'clock tomorrow shall I send to thee? By the hour of nine. I will not fail. Tis twenty years till then. Uh, well, uh, I'll see you tonight, Mary. Bye, Mrs. Lang. Goodbye. Bye, Bye. Bye. Gosh, I... Oh! Oh, Bill! <laughs> Oh, I guess I'm all right. Well, bye. Bye. Hey, Jay! Oh, Jay! Hey. Well, hey. Hey, Dad, you got anything for me? Well, there should be. Don't something. bother your father yeah, every see, night. Yeah. Uh, have you? There you are. What made you so late, Bill? I was getting worried. Oh, I had to study, Ma. He was not. I saw him out walking with his girl. Bill's got a girl. Got a girl. Ma, make him cut it out. Junior. Well, Bill has got a girl. Quiet. And put that candy away till after dinner. Henry, you shouldn't have given it to him. Well, he has got a girlfriend and her name is Mary. Yeah, I'll shut you up. Bill, Junior, put that candy on. Well, what I'm burned up about is it just didn't say Bill had a swell girl. Gee, it must be, though. She'd have to be swell for you to like her. Uh-huh. 
Sounds like you want something. Come on, what is it? Well, it's my model airplane. It won't work. Gosh, Bill, you can fix it. You can fix anything. <laughs> okay, I'll fix it. Mary told me to wait and tell her she had to go home. Her mother wanted her to go to the dressmaker with her. Oh, thanks, Jimmy. Hmm, must be getting grown up. I see Mary let you have the car. Yeah. Want to take you any place? Well, I wasn't going any place in particular. Well, then, how about driving me over to the show place with me? I'll buy you a soda. I never drink that stuff. Oh, gee, I'll buy you something else. Okay. You're on the hook for one root beer. Well... I know you like that really well. 
Jack, give me a cigarette before you go, will you? You're not eating your breakfast again. Don't Harper hasn't been around lately. Anything wrong between you two? Why should there be anything wrong? There shouldn't be, I'm sure. And whatever it is isn't serious, I know. I'm sorry, Mother, for snapping at you like that. Don't worry about it, dear. Why don't you speak frankly to Bill? He'll be honest, whatever the trouble is. I'm sure Bill Harper never lied about anything. Yes, that's right. Bill's mother says he never lies. There, you see. You think it'd be all right if, if I speak to him about it? Why, of course. Oh, Jimmy. Oh, what? Sit down, darling, and I'll have your breakfast for you in a moment. Jimmy. What have I got to worry about? Why don't you tell me? Oh, for Pete's sake, don't start to cross-examine me, will you? I'm all right. Jimmy! Don't let Mother see you like that. There is no doubt that there is an organized gang distributing the narcotic to students. Not only in my school, but all over the city. You government men have got to find some way to put an end to it. Of course, I agree with you, Dr. Carroll. But do you realize that marijuana is not like other forms of dope? 
You see, it grows wild in almost every state in the Union. Therefore, there is practically no interstate commerce in the drug. As a result, the government's hands are tied. And frankly, the only sure cure is a widespread campaign in education. Oh, it's all right to talk about education, Mr. Wyatt. But we educators can't do anything until the public is sufficiently aroused. Let me show you something. In 1930, the records on marijuana in the Washington office of the Narcotics Division scarcely filled a small folder like this. Today, they fill cabinets. All these devoted to marijuana records. Here is an example. A 16-year-old lad apprehended in the act of staging a holdup. 16 years old and a marijuana addict. Here is a most tragic case. Yes, I remember. Just a young boy. Under the influence of the drug, he killed his entire family with an axe. Then there is the most vicious type of case. Here, in Michigan, a young girl, 17 years old, a reefer smoker, taken in a raid in the company with five young men. Here is a particularly flagrant case. Yes, I remember the newspapers made quite a play of it. In West Virginia, wasn't it? Yes. And there are hundreds of them coming up, new ones every day. I'd like to take these records, if I may. I feel they would be of invaluable assistance to me in combating the evil in my school. You're very welcome, Dr. Carroll. Thank you. Sit down, Bill. There seems to be something wrong. What is it? You were always a fine student. You always had excellent grades. Well, I guess the work is getting a little harder, Dr. Carroll. No, no, it isn't that. Bill, I'd like to help you. But of course I can't unless you let me. You're undermining your help. Well, there's nothing, Dr. Carroll. Really, there isn't. I'll study harder, honest. Honest? If you were being honest with me and honest with yourself, I'm afraid you'd tell me an entirely different story. Bill, I'm, I'm going to ask you a straightforward question. And I'd like to have a straightforward answer. Yes, sir. Isn't it true that you have, perhaps unwillingly, acquired a certain harmful habit through association with certain undesirable people? Well? Oh, no, sir, I haven't, Dr. Carroll. Well, that is, you... You see, I'm... I'm worried about something at home. All right, my boy. We'll just have to let it go at that. But remember, if you ever want to confide in me, no one will ever be the wise. Well, thank you, Dr. Carroll. Hello, Mary. You want to play a set? Thanks, Teddy, but I'm waiting for someone. Well, if you're waiting for Bill, he hasn't been here for weeks.
morning, Miss. We're from the police department. Good morning. We're tracing a hit-and-run driver. Someone caught the license number at the place of the accident but didn't get it quite right. So we're checking all numbers like it, and yours is one of them. Well, I'll try to help you. You remember what you did on the 29th of last month? Oh, that was the day before Mother's birthday. Oh, yes, I remember that because I left school and went directly to the dressmakers with Mother. I was there all afternoon. Did you happen to loan your car to a couple of men? No, no, I, I had the car all afternoon myself. Well, thanks, Miss. Sorry to have troubled you. Tell me, uh, did they... was the person killed? Fortunately, he wasn't, but that's still no excuse for hit-and-run driving. Has Jimmy Lane been here today? He was in. He went over to May's place. You know where that is. Well, uh, he was going to wait for me here. So he didn't give me May's address. Are you sure Jimmy didn't leave any message for me? Mary? No, he didn't. But I guess you're okay. I'll write it down for you. He went out to take Agnes home, but he'll be right back. Come in and sit down, Mary, and let me take your coat. Who's the new kid just came in? Oh, it's that gal that Ralph's gone overboard for. Funny, we've never been able to get her out here before. Are you sure Jimmy will be back soon? Sure, any minute.
back. Is she all right? She's dead. May, get me some water. Now listen, you two. I want you to get out of here. Get out of here and forget you're ever in here today. I'll handle this. Now get going. Mary, Mary, what happened? You killed her. High School, did you, during the last three months, notice any changes in the demeanor and attitude of your student, William Hopper? Yes, in a number of things. For example, a times disassociation of ideas. In uh, another instance, I happened to attend the recent interscholastic tennis matches. And while Bill Harper had been considered an exceedingly good player, I saw him miss the ball by as much as three or four feet. This, I understand, could be attributed to the use of marijuana. It causes errors in time and space. Objection, Your Honor. The witness isn't qualified to express opinions upon the effect of narcotics. Sustained. Dr. Carroll has been called merely as a character witness. Well, then, although you didn't know, to your own knowledge, that the defendant was using marijuana, did you notice any changes that would lead you to believe, as an educator, that he was under some severe mental strain, which might possibly have been induced by some drug? Yes, I recall distinctly a few weeks ago, 
It was during a class of English literature. There was a serious discussion of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet when he suddenly burst into an uncontrollable fit of hysterical laughter. Oh, by the way, Dr. Carroll, six months ago, what would have been your opinion regarding the character of my client? He was a fine, upstanding American boy, a good scholar, a good athlete, and representative of the caliber of young men we are proud to graduate from our school. Oh, snap out of it, will you? It's not our fault. Why'd I ever bring him up there anyway? He's just a kid. I can't hang him. Shut up, shut up! Why don't you let yourself go? Talk! Go off there nuts and have me that way too. It was his own fault, wasn't it? Shut up! They've got us hidden now, haven't they? The cops can't find us. Jack, I want to get out of this place. You're going to stay here as long as we have to keep those two out there undercover. Until the trial's over. Or the boss gets a better idea. But they're getting on my nerves. It can't last much longer. I'm not worried about her. we got to keep him gagged. Oh, he's about ready to crack. All you got to do is keep him from having too many reefers. Any day now, that punk will get hot. He'll probably spill until all he knows if he gets a chance. I don't think he'll get it. I'll see you later. Where are you going? I'm going to see the boss. gentlemen of the jury, have a duty to perform, a duty to yourselves and to our community. Mary Lane is dead. The evidence you've heard at this trial could not have failed to convince you of the guilt of the defendant. By his own admission, he pressed the trigger of the weapon that sent lovely and innocent Mary Lane to a tragic and untimely death. We are not so much concerned about the motives behind the deed as to the deed itself. While the defendant has told you that he saw someone attacking Mary Lane, and that his mind went blank from that moment on, the defense has been unable to produce one witness to substantiate that statement. Now, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have heard able men testify at this trial, men who have tried to bring out the facts, that the defendant might have become momentarily insane when he fired the shot that killed Mary Lane. But the defense has been unable to prove that he was insane. William Harper was sane when he visited the apartment where the tragedy occurred. He was in the habit of visiting the place. He was sane when he went into a bedroom with another young woman. You all heard what went on in that room. You heard it from the defendant's own lips. Involved as he was in a tawdry love affair, Mary Lane was in the way. She had found him out. In a moment of anger, he deliberately and willfully killed her. If such deeds are permitted to go unpunished, this community would cease to be a decent and safe place for us or our children to live. I do not believe I have to plead or even demand that you bring in a verdict 
to punish the defendant for the crime that he has committed against society. You are upright citizens. That is why you were chosen to judge another. And as honest, upright citizens, there is only one verdict which you can find, and that is a verdict of guilty. And this court will be adjourned until the jury's verdict is reached. I suppose you all feel the same about this case. But he might have been insane when no. he did it. No, he wasn't. He knew what he was doing. But supposing he was insane? You can never make me believe it, nor anybody else. We'll uh, take a first vote. One for acquittal. But there's a reasonable doubt about the boy's sanity. We can't. No doubt about the fact that he murdered her. He admitted it himself. That wasn't the first time he was there. We gotta make an example. Before boys like that contaminate all of our children. We can't have every murderer hiding behind the gag that he's insane. Sure, they see red before they kill somebody. But whose fault is it? the verdict? We have. The defendant will rise. What is your verdict? You find the defendant guilty. Discharged. Jack. Look, 
Captain, but get hanged. He'll be here. Don't worry, he'll be here in a little while. I've got to see him. You've got to see him. Give me a glass of water. Who's behind you? No, no, no. Go hang if you don't smoke. No. Who hired you and Jack Perry? Are you ready to know what you know?
If we can gain some measure of leniency for my client, she is prepared to enter a plea of guilty and, in addition, turn state's evidence in the case of William Harper. I regret that this court is not prepared to bargain with justice. I'll tell anyway. I was there. I saw it. I know who killed Mary. And I'll tell you who killed Mary Lane. It wasn't Bill. It was Jack. Jack Perry. He shot Mary and then he put the gun in Bill's hand. We were all at the apartment one afternoon. And Mary came in looking for her brother. Bill and I, we'd been in another room. And Bill came in. He caught Ralph with Mary, and they started to fight. But it was Jack who had the gun. He was going to hit Bill over the head with it to make him stop. And then, then the gun went off. I saw it. I could see it now. It was horrible. And before he knew it, Mary, Mary was dead. But you see, Judge, Bill didn't know he hadn't killed Mary. He was so doped up, they made him think he had. Ralph wanted to tell you, too. Oh, if they don't let him. But well, this is the truth, Jack. I'm telling you the truth. After Jack saw the poor he was dead, he put the gun in Bill's hand. It was Jack's fault. And it was my fault, too. I got all of them to come up to the apartment. I am just as much to blame. I am. I am. Do I understand you wish to plead guilty to a charge of fostering moral delinquency in the case of William Harper? Yes, yes, I'm guilty. I am. Prepare a statement for signature and also an order setting aside the jury's verdict in the case of the people versus William Harper. In the interests of justice, I shall direct a verdict of not guilty. Sign here, please. will be brought into court on Thursday, the 17th, when sentence will be pronounced. Meanwhile, you will be held as a material witness in the case of the people versus Ralph Wiley. revolving about an unhappy and unfortunate case, one whose horrible tragedy will forever remain with me. I am happy to have been enabled, before it was too late, to order the verdict of the jury in the case of the people versus William Harper to be set aside. But, young man, although this court is convinced that to declare you guilty would have been a gross miscarriage of justice, we cannot condone your acts. 
and we can express only the hope that your experiences may not alone keep you, but thousands of others from the vicious pitfalls of marijuana. Thus, I am ordering you to remain in this court during the next case, so that you will be obliged to witness what you yourself so narrowly escaped. Call the case of the people versus Ralph Wiley. trial of the defendant, Ralph Wiley. It is convinced that he is hopelessly and incurably insane, a condition caused by the drug marijuana to which he was addicted. It is recommended, Your Honor, that the defendant be placed at an institution for the criminally insane for the rest of his natural life. Defendant counsel joins the state in this request. Since counsel for the defense, as well as counsel for the state, seem to agree on this, I see no reason why the request should not be granted. Yes, that happened right here, to your neighbors. It is not too much to say that in your hands lies the possibility of averting other tragedies like it. We must work untiringly so that our children are obliged to learn the truth. Because it is only through knowledge that we can safely protect them. Failing this, the next tragedy may be that of your daughter or your son or yours, or yours, or yours.